And there I was, eight years old, right there in the bathroom. I never forget. My mother said, hey, I'm going to talk to you. You know, it was right before school. And she said, you know, honestly, I'm not your biological mother. Me, I didn't even know the word biological men at eight years old. So she explained to me that she wasn't my natural mother. And that was the term she used. And I still didn't know what it meant. So then she explained to me that she was going to take me to see who my see she was going to take me to see my mother that weekend. So we went to this apartment building right there on Fifth and Rhode Island, Northwest, and we get on the elevator and we go up to like the eighth floor, seventh or eighth floor, and I meet this woman, and this woman looks young. That's because she is young. Very, very light complected, very, very short hair, but extremely, but the woman's very pretty. And she greets me with a really, really big hug. I'm still kind of confused. And I'm just wondering how is this woman my mother when I've been living with this other woman all of this time? So that confusion, uh, you know, with, with confusion, you have questions. And I began to ask questions, you know. Where was she at? Um, and she said she was living in New York. Come to find out she was living in New York because she was in a recovery home. Um, living in a recovery home, you know, trying to recover from uh, an addiction. So the addiction she was recovering from was using drugs right after she had me. So after she had me, she had met a gentleman. And this is the story I've heard. She met a gentleman who got her addicted to crack cocaine. This is in the year of 1987. I'm born December 1986, so in 1987, she became addicted to crack cocaine. And when she became addicted to this drug, she would leave me at home with my grandfather. My grandfather became my caretaker. My mother who I lived with was actually my aunt she had come to visit me at the house and she said she didn't like the atmosphere <clears throat> that I was living in she said it was a lot of smoke it was a lot of women and she didn't feel like me sleeping in a drawer was um, feasible for a six-month-old so at that time she went there and without my grandfather's consent, she took me from his house and she took me to her home in Mount Rainier, Maryland. So I'm working at the Highsville District Courthouse and I come back from lunch from a fast food joint with one of my coworkers. And I'm sitting there as I do, I drink one gallon of water every single day. But this day was slightly different. After lunch, we had got back probably about five minutes afterwards because it was right down the street. And as we're sitting there, I started to feel this outer body. <clears throat> I started to feel this outer body experience where I couldn't breathe. So I gasped for air and I said, yo, I can't breathe. And she didn't, you know, I'm a very playful guy. You know, we have a good time at work. So she thought I was joking. So I grabbed my big jug of water and I started to chug it and I felt better. And she said, do you want me to call the ambulance? I said, yes, please, can you do that? So they came and in the midst of them coming, I felt it again. So I had to continue to drink this water. I had no clue what was really going on with me. So when they got there, they checked my blood pressure. It was 180 over 100, which was abnormal. So they told me just go home, relax. I went home, relaxed, didn't feel it anymore. I went to another fast food spot the following week and I felt the same Thing when I started to eat this food. So I knew something was wrong. Then there was a night where I was leaving from a nightclub and I got pulled over by a police officer and I had dead tags. They had just expired. So instead of him telling me to go home, he said, I'm towing your vehicle. Now I have no car. I'm all the way in Riverdale, Maryland. I have to walk all the way, he locked me up and he let me right out. And I take a long walk home from Riverdale, Maryland to Mount Rainier. That long walk home 
was one of the last walk homes I could remember before I ended up in the hospital. The next morning, the very next morning, I didn't wake up. My sister found me in my room suffering from a seizure. So she called the ambulance. And the last thing I remember that morning was being carted down the steps at my parents' house in a gurney. And they took me to Prince George's Hospital Center. Prince George's Hospital Center ran a lot of tests on me and they could not figure out what was wrong. So they sent me over to GW Hospital. And when I got to GW Hospital, they told me, they ran CAT scans, they ran a bunch of tests and they said, you have an ulterior venous malformation. I have no clue what that means, but they're basically saying that blood is not flowing through my brain properly. Do I suffer from headaches? And I'm like, I do have headaches pretty often, maybe like once a week. And it's all making sense now. So I made the executive decision to get it treated. They said, you could leave here right now and it could hemorrhage or we can fix it for you. And it's going to be an eight hour surgery. That eight hour surgery turns to 13 hours. And I, the only thing I remember was waking up in the hallway, strapped to a bed, arms, legs, and seeing people walking back and forth. And I had a trachea in my throat and I couldn't scream for help. And I felt like forever just being there. And when they finally took me to the room, they took the trachea out of my throat, they unstrapped my arms, and they pulled a catheter from out of my penis. The weirdest feeling ever, because now I'm wondering how did it even get in there? <laughs> So imagine being down and out. <clears throat> so imagine being down and out and not having any more funds and trying to find a job. You just really can't find a job. So I'm online, Facebook to be exact, and I'm seeing a bunch of my high school buddies looking like they're doing something and I need parts. So one day I hit my boy up and I said, yo, let me uh, meet up with me real quick. I want to talk to you about something. So I broke it down for him. I said, bro, I don't have a job. I have no money. It's 2008. It's a recession. Gas prices are high. What are y'all doing, man? He breaks it down for me and says, look, I'm gonna put you in contact with somebody and they'll let you in on everything. So the next day, a guy says, this is all you gotta do. Take these bags right here, go in this store, Return the, pro return the product and bring me back the cash. I said, that's it? Is it stolen? He said, nah, we pay for it. So I go in the store, I return the merchandise, I get the cash, he gives me $600 out of the, the bulk that I gave him. I said, bro, I do this every day, let me know. So I did it every single day for 30 days. I saved almost $20,000 cash, now imagine, I just went from having $0 in a bank account to now having $20,000 cash, all in rubber bands inside of a push-up box. I kept it in my room, and the only person I showed was my little sister. And I showed her just in case something happened to me and she needed funds. So I find out a way to acquire these credit cards that are being utilized to purchase this product. I meet a young lady at a restaurant and she says, hey, I don't know what you do for a living, but I got this little box. I knew that little box from what I saw with my boy. And I said, she was like, there was a guy who gave it to me and he hasn't hit me back. First thing in my mind says, he must've got locked up. Let me get that. These little boxes are skimmers and they have passcodes on them. I can't guess his passcode, but I put 0000 and it opened up. He had 120 numbers on there. I'm good. Now I got 120 credit card numbers that I can utilize. Now I have a good heart and I do believe in karma because I was raised in the church. But one thing I did know is that if I utilize somebody's card, they could get their money back. So that's why I used it and felt okay doing it, even though it was wrong. 
So I had this 120 num credit card numbers that I could utilize and I was up. I no longer needed that plug, I had my own. And from that day on, I dealt with her one time and then I cut her off. Reason being, there's a compromise point that I knew about, that if too many people were reporting their cards from one establishment, it would come back to this young lady. So I said, let me use her once, use her twice, and now I'm on to the next place. So it sounds like I'm kind of like a criminal in my mind, but I was being very strategic. I had really, really long locks at that time. So when I would go to these stores to return this merchandise, to not make it look so obvious, I would wear a suit to go in there so that I could look like I blended in with the working class people as opposed to walking in in street gear on a random Tuesday. I would also wear, and my wife to this day remembers I met her for lunch, I had on scrubs like I worked at a hospital. Blue scrubs with the matching blue bottom, I would tuck it in and I would wear a lanyard around my neck and tuck it right here with no badge. Just tuck it right here so that when I would go in stores, they would think, oh, he works at a hospital. We're not gonna give him a hard time returning this merchandise. And there I was, almost a hundred grand strong with credit card funds. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching the making of an entrepreneur docuseries. I just want to take a moment to talk to you. That, that's right, you that's watching right now. Um, you the mom, or maybe you're the dad, or, or maybe you're, you're an entrepreneur, or perhaps you're an auntie or an uncle, but you're someone out there that, that has a heart to give, uh, you have a heart to serve, and as you're watching this making of an entrepreneur docuseries, you may be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, wait a minute, I've had some, some life lessons, I've, I've had some setbacks, I've had some experiences, I've gone through some things that have helped me become a better person, and, and I wanna take that and I wanna release that to other folks. Okay. Maybe you're a speaker and you're already doing it. Maybe you've written books and you've already done that. Or maybe the story that's inside of you, the expertise that's inside of you, the message inside of you, this is the right platform for you to make a bigger difference and a bigger impact in the world. Now, this whole making of an entrepreneur docuseries, um, if you had to sum it up in, in just one word, and it's kind of hard to do that, but as I'm talking to you and you're listening right now, you might be saying, Shay, what's the one word? And the one word I would say is just legacy legacy. Um, there's a legacy I understand that you want to leave for your family, and I get that, but there's also a legacy of your knowledge. There's a legacy of your expertise, and think about this. You're able to share your message or share your story or share your expertise, and, and long after you're gone, they still have a window into the soul of who you are and the impact that that leaves behind. And if that's you and you someone that's wanna get the information, you're, you're someone that's ready to do something bigger than just your business and bigger than just making more money, but you wanna have more meaning in the world, uh, do me a favor. Go over to www.themakingofanentrepreneurdocuseries.com. I know that's a long email, a long address, but I want you to hear it again one more time. Themakingofanentrepreneur.com. Now, when you get there, just put your first name and your last name and your phone number and information in there Worst case scenario, you have a meeting with the team and decide, hey, me being a cast member, this isn't a good fit, but I had a lot of fun. Best case scenario, you decide to take a step. Folks understand your backstory, uh, understand what you've been through, and uh, the world is much better off um, while you're here. And when the day comes and you decide to transition and, and move on, it's still doing very, very well. So with that being said, I just want to pop in. Thanks a lot for watching the Making of an Entrepreneur series. Uh, my name is Shay Brown. I want to encourage you to continue to watch and um, I'll see you at the next episode. God bless. So life is good, you know, making good money, but I'm living in my mom's house in Mount Rainier. So one day we went to Fridays in Greenbelt, me and my boy, and we get a call. Hey, you should come down to the go-go with us. I said, cool, I got to go home, change up, shower up, blah, blah, blah. We're driving home, and apparently the guy who I'm with is not paying attention to his rearview mirror. So we pull up in front of my parents' house, and someone parks at the bottom of the hill. I saw the cars I got out, and I asked him, I said, yo, how long was that car behind us? He said, oh, no, they ain't, they ain't nothing. I pay attention. All right, no problem. I go in the house, I shower, and we're getting ready to go out to the go-go. 
As I walk out the house, he walks out in front of me. I look and I see two dudes across the way walking towards him with a gun. And I see my boy lay down. I take off down the street. I run, I bend another corner, bend another corner. And then I end up at the liquor store down the street and they're like, are you okay? I say, yeah, I'm good. But they can see it on my face that I'm not okay. And I'm just in there just cause I just want to be out of sight, out of mind. I walk back up the street to my house, my door's open and my mom is standing there with my boy. And he's in there telling her that they just took $7,000 cash from him, his car keys and his cell phone. At this point, I knew two things. He doesn't pay attention to his surroundings. That's a problem. And I gotta get away from this household because Mount Rainier is not, it was not a trustworthy area during that period of time. So two weeks later, I moved to Bowie to a nice luxury apartment and I'm living there and everything's all good. I'm still moving and shaking and we're going to clubs, we're partying. But one thing that I like to do is I like to be in control of the road and I'm the one who's driving. All of my boys live in Laurel, but I live in Bowie. So I said, I'll cancel my lease here and I'll move to Laurel. I moved to Laurel with my boy, the same one from the previous story. We get an apartment together in Russet. Everything is all good. We're able to save our money. We, we have really dirt cheap rent, you know, for the volume of work that we get, for the amount of money that we make. And one day he brings these guys to the house that are friends with his, that are friends with his girlfriend. His girlfriend's from Baltimore and I love Baltimore, but these dudes look like Baltimore for real. And he introduced me to them. I said, how y'all doing fellas? And I could see that they were kind of looking around and I didn't like that. The very next day I go out early in the morning, head out to the gym. And guess what? When I come back home, my door is pushed in. I'm thinking, well, if it was the police, they would have probably came while I was there to arrest me. But then I start looking around and I noticing things missing. The very first thing I do is go to my closet and look at my safe and it's gone. His money counter is taken. The TV off the wall is taken. The PS4 is taken. The little bit of cash that I had sitting in my closet for that night to go out, taken. So now I'm like, I made a bad decision moving to Laurel with him. I'm out. But before I could say I was out, the apartment complex kicked us out. So now I moved to another part of Laurel by myself and everything is all good. I'm making cooking videos. I had a girlfriend at the time. You know, uh, all my neighbors love me. I had a nice dog. We're still going to the clubs and partying. And before you know it, my girlfriend moves in with me. I'm making these videos. And when I say videos, I'm talking about cooking instruction videos on YouTube and Facebook. People are loving it when I post these videos. So I'm beginning to really think that culinary arts is my lane. And this content videos that I'm putting together, very amateur like now when I look back at them, but everybody starts somewhere. Let's fast forward to about two years down the road. Two years later down the road, one of my boys gets his door kicked in. They arrest him, his girlfriend calls me. Oh my gosh, they just took him. I'm like, who? Secret service. I'm scared, but hey, I'm living in a townhouse at the time. It's not in my name. I don't think that they can come get me, but I'm still looking out my window. He gets out the other individual in the case. They kick his door in. 
the other individual kick his door in. I just know I'm next. It's all four of us, three of them gone, it's just me left. But they never come and get me. All three of them get out and they all call me and they say, you need to go turn yourself in. They keep asking about you. So I make the executive decision to go turn myself in. I call a police, I call a commissioner buddy of mine and said, hey, can I turn myself in with you so that I can get out? And she said, yeah, come on, turn yourself in. I turn myself in there at Upper Marlboro thinking I'm going to get out. And they say, no, you have an outstanding warrant in Montgomery County. They transferred me to Montgomery County. I had 82 counts of state fraud credit card. I don't know what they call it. I bailed myself out there. They sent me to Anne Arundel. I have outstanding warrant for a missed court date that took place during that period of time. From Anne Arundel County, I had a detainer by the Secret Service. Secret Service, U.S. Marshals come pick me up. And that ride was the longest ride from Anne Arundel County to the U.S. Eastern District Courthouse. When I got to that courthouse, better yet, back up. That, that drive, when I asked him questions like, why didn't you come to my home? He said, we didn't know where you stayed at. We thought you lived with your mother. They said, you don't have any places in your name, but we see all your YouTube videos and we see all the cooking you're doing. I thought that was pretty funny that they were watching the videos, but couldn't find where I was living at. But they said it was very honorable that I turned myself in. And once I go in front of the court, they would let me out like they did everyone else. I get there. And I stand in front of the judge, Judge Anthony J. Tringer at the Eastern District Court, Eastern District of Virginia. And he tells me that I am going to remain in the custody of the U.S. Marshals because I'm a flight risk. I'm confused because I'm now wondering how am I a flight risk? I'm an American, don't know how. And I stayed there. And I stayed there and this is my first long prison sentence in a county jail. So while serving time in a federal prison, you begin to realize that you couldn't have been placed in this place if you weren't doing anything wrong. Because at first I was blaming others for telling, for not having loyalty to me, and then I realized they wouldn't have to have loyalty to me if I wasn't doing anything wrong. So during the period of time while I was away at a federal medium prison in New Jersey, Fort Dix FCI, I began to realize that I got to really lock in on my culinary arts. So I would ask individuals to send me recipe books any type of recipe magazine book. And I just wanted to study it and study different foods, send me cookbooks. So when I get out, I can hit the ground running. I literally built my website in there. So when I came home, all I had to do was input everything. I had a bio, I had menus, I had pretty much everything to really start and hit the ground running as a personal chef because as people told me while I was in there, if you really put as much into your personal chef as you did with the fraud that you were doing, you may be 10 times further. And that is what motivates me to this day. So upon release, March 6th, 2014 from prison, I was released. And the first thing you're asked to do is find a job. So I would go to jobs and I would be honest on the application to say, yes, I have a felony and I would never hear back from it. But someone at the halfway house I was at said, you know, it cost them a lot of money to run federal background checks. So if you don't have anything in the state, I think you're fine. And I had no state cases, maybe a, you know, driving on suspended or maybe, you know, speeding ticket here and there, but nothing criminal on my state record. So I began checking, no, I don't have a felony. And guess what? I began getting jobs and I just wanted to put food on the table. So I would take jobs making $11 an hour, $12 an hour as a 27, 28 year old man, just to be able to feed my family. And these were staffing agencies. So I would have a job for two weeks here, 
a month here, at the most 90 days here, but it never stopped me from wanting to be able to provide, you know? I had a little bit of money when I came home, but that little bit of money, less than $10,000, didn't last me one bit. So I continued to look for jobs and I continued to get staff and agency. I continued to send my resumes to different places and I continued to have jobs for little, for short periods of time. No, I, could, I did not have one permanent job between 2014 and 2019. Staff and agencies, like, and I ain't gonna list them, you know, would literally hire me and tell me this job is temp to hire. And I'd get excited, like I finally can take care of my family while still pursuing culinary arts and still being able to provide people with events because I was still doing events, but the events weren't coming in at the volume I needed to be able to take care of a household. So my last job, I was hired in 2018 by Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin hired me as a contractor and it was a year long contract to be renewed and possibly bought on permanent. So in 2018, February, they bought me on. I'm making $19 an hour. I'm excited. I'm rocking and rolling. Business is kind of taking off at that time. And the contract gets cut about 10 months in. Why did it get cut? They cut the contract because I asked for a raise. Why did I ask for a raise? Because they initially hired me to be the executive assistant for three individuals but I'm so well organized and people saw how fast I worked. I literally was doing executive assistant work for 11 people. So when I asked them, could they give me a raise because I'm working for all of these people, their response is, you are only supposed to work for those three people and you cannot work for those other people. Now, what did that do? That caused tension in the workplace. So now everyone's upset with me because the staffing agency the contract company told me to stop working for these other individuals. And guess what? I lost my job. The next month I went on TV one and I haven't looked back since. When I was on there, my following raised up, my following went up. People online began to look at me as a more notable individual and business began to thrive so much to the point where I didn't even need the job anymore. I started this thing called a juice cleanse. Now I naturally drink these same three juices once a week, celery juice, carrot juice, and beet juice. They have ginger, lemon, lime, and all of them. Sometimes I put an apple on the beet to kind of cut it down. And when I started advertising this online, right after I lost that job, people started asking me, hey, are those for sale? And I said, yeah. And I made up a package called the three-day juice cleanse or the five-day juice cleanse. You get it for $60 or $120. I started marketing online and I literally was selling about 25 cleanses a day. And when I began selling these cleanses, I started to notice a lot of my friends started to become, become very envious of me because they saw the volume I was selling. And the joke around town was, Ant quit his job to sell beet juice. I can't make this up because I actually saw the text message that somebody sent to someone else. And I'm thinking to myself, if you made the type of money that I was making selling beet juice, you should quit your job too. <laughs> So imagine the first time you heard about one of the biggest magazines in your area while you're locked up. I knew nothing about the Washingtonian while I was at home. But when I went, when I got locked up, I heard about this magazine called the Washingtonian and an individual had given it to me because they wanted to share some recipes with me. And I always thought to myself, if I could ever be featured in this magazine, Nah, I probably couldn't. So what I did was early in the pandemic, I released a cookbook called The Little Vegan Chef. And it's a children's book with really fun, tasty recipes that probably take you five, 10 minutes and you can make it at home. 
I thought it was genius for the simple fact that everyone's at home, kids are driving you crazy. Here's some fun recipes to make at home, you know, as a family. In the book is probably, not even probably, it's sold more books than all of the other seven books I put together. Probably more so because we're all at home, but also the content is great. So what I started to do was when I saw the sales going up, let me do my own press as I've always done my own PR. And I started reaching out to authors, uh, journalists. I started reaching out to journalists of different articles. So I would go to Google, type in chef, hit news, and go down the list. And I copy and paste the name of the person, and then I'll put it back in Google and say, uh, let's for example, Lorena Washington, email. And then you can find her email. Sometimes you can click on the name and their email be there, their Twitter be there, and I'm reaching out, hey, how you doing? I'm Chef Anthony Thomas. I'm a 30, well, how old was I then? 32, I'm a 32 year old personal chef. I just released this cookbook. I love your platform. I love the story you wrote about X, Y, and Z. And they'd write back. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Tell me more about this book. So then I tell them this and they set up some time. We'd have interview after interview. Um, and then they write a story about me. Those stories translate into dollars because now people is driving traffic to your website, is driving traffic to the book. They wrote about me in the Washingtonian, not only the Washingtonian, the South China Morning Post, the Beat, um, Vig News, which is one of the biggest UK magazines. You know, it was really a really good time for me during the pandemic because I felt like I could thrive through these book sales. Even though I couldn't touch the masses and do personal chef events, I could touch them by being in their home, on their countertop, or on their bookshelf. <laughs> It's a great day. My name is Shay Brown. I just want to speak to you, the speaker, or maybe not even a speaker, right? Maybe you're not a speaker, but you have a message inside of you that you want to release, or maybe you have a story, right? A story of your life, a story in your career, or, or maybe, maybe as you're listening right now, you're an expert, right? You're, you're, you're an expert at teaching people how to do something. You're expert at raising kids. And I want you to imagine for a moment that you had an opportunity to share your message or your story on a bigger stage. And I'm gonna talk about that in a moment and what that would mean for you if you could reach your target audience, if you're an entrepreneur, if that target audience got associated to the problem that you solve, or if you're a super entrepreneur with sales funnels out there, not only did it get associated to who you were, but they were able to join your list. Now for other folks, that won't make no sense at all. But for you, the entrepreneur, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I want to invite you over to something called the Comeback Champion Summit. And, and the whole purpose of the Comeback Champion Summit is really to do one thing, which is one word, and that is possibilities. That's right. When, when you get a chance to get on stage, uh, you get a chance to do it virtually, and some of you maybe in person, and you get a chance to share your story. So something deep, deep inside of you. I always say your message, because some of you have a message or your expertise, then guess what happens? Three things happen. Number one, you get to make a difference. And isn't that why you are on this earth? I mean, I don't want to get emotional here, but you're really on this earth to make a difference for someone else. Something has happened to you so it can go through you to someone else. And being able to speak on a, on a, on a platform that provides an audience, it's like, a, like having a microphone that allows you to help more people faster. So that's, that's number one. Uh, number two, when you're on a, a platform, I'm gonna invite you to the Comeback Champion Summit, you get a chance to have more meaning in the world, to have more impact and to have more influence. And that's really who we're looking for. We're looking for folks out there who have an interest, want or desire of serving others. So if that's you, that's you, I'm gonna invite you to go over to www.comebackchampionsummit.com. Again, comebackchampionsummit.com. Click the button, it'll say apply to speak. Go through the process. And if it's a good fit, can't wait to share your story over at the Comeback Champion Summit or any one of our platforms that serves other folks. With that being said, um, my name, by the way, is Shea Brown, the happy entrepreneur. Make it a great day, everyone. And um, we'll make some good things happen. We connect again real soon. See you out. So one thing you can do is you can make a mistake, but the mistake you cannot be defined, you won't always be defined by because you can always bounce back from that mistake. You remember earlier when I was telling you about how I had met my mom when I was eight years old and how she had made a mistake 
and how she recovered from this mistake. It's the same thing in life, you know. Same thing with me when I went to prison. I made a mistake. I did the wrong thing for four years. And guess what? The government took two years from me. But the mistake that I will never make again is breaking the law by committing those type of crimes because it doesn't pay to break the law. Another thing that I've realized is how you talk to in another thing I realized is how you talk to individuals is what you'll get back. So growing up, after I got my driver's license, police would pull me over based on my hair. I had locks or the car I was driving. I had Grand Marquises, Crown Vicks. I had a Honda Accord, Range Rover, Aurora's. But some of those vehicles are stereotypical vehicles for thugs or gangsters or whatever they want to consider me. So when they would pull me over, I never told you I was a criminal justice major. In my mind, I wanted to challenge them and question them. Why are you pulling me over? You know, and talking to a police officer who took their job to protect and serve, but also to have power was so that you could bow down to them. So one thing I know now, when I get pulled over, police officer, black, white, lady, man, officer, I'm so sorry, I apologize. I know I, I ran through the light, I was just trying to get home or what, you know, whatever was going on. And, and, and they love that. And guess what they do now? Slow it down. Don't come through here speeding like that no more. Or I'm not even gonna run your license registration. Don't let me see you again. And it feels good just knowing that I've gotten to that place now. And it feels bad that I didn't know this back then, but guess what? That's how I talk to individuals, police officers, people in the grocery store, people in the street, people anywhere. What you put into the universe is what you'll get back. And I think that that's what makes us decent human beings by putting that positivity into the universe. And you get it right back every time. So realizing that you don't have to be stagnant in one career path. You could, you can transition from one thing to another, no matter what, until you find what makes you happy. I wake up every single morning and know that if I have to do one event or two events, I'm not tired of it. One question that people like to ask me, and I say I probably hear it maybe once a month is, do you ever get tired of cooking? And I always think to myself, do you get tired of sleeping? Like, I truly enjoy cooking, but at the same time, it's something that's a necessity, just like sleep is. And if I know I'm gonna use the highest quality ingredients, why would I go and eat something that isn't utilizing those type of ingredients versus what I'm gonna put in? Plus I know what's in it, it's made with love, and I can have whatever I want any time of the day, and I don't have to drive somewhere other than the grocery, other than the grocery store to grab the items to make. Um, you know, being able to transition from one career path to another. There's so many people that have worked with me and one year they're a chef and I'm giving them mentorship and the next year they're a nail tech. I know one person that was a, a chef for three years and now she's a blogger. I know another guy that was a chef with me and now he's a photographer and I know someone who, who really showed me a lot of passion as a chef and now they're a fashion model. Doing, and they're all doing great in them. And I say that to say because you don't want to feel like you're chasing something because of the money. And I always tell people who say, oh, your price is a little high. I say, you know, my price isn't high because I'm charging you for um, the food. You're getting charged, and I don't say this, you're getting charged for the experience. You know, what I provide, you can't find anywhere else. No other chef is doing it. They're all cooking, yes, we're all making mac and cheese, we're all making mashed potatoes, we're all making fried chicken. But at the same time, are they using the same ingredients that I'm using, the same highest quality ingredients that I'm utilizing? So, you know, to tie it all back in, you know, just knowing that you can, if, if it makes you happy, 
then you're in the right field. If it doesn't make you happy, find something that makes you happy. Like there's nothing I would change about being a personal chef. And I'm gonna leave you with this last one. When people say, hey, are you opening up a restaurant? Are you gonna open up a restaurant? Like that's the end all be all. And I think to myself, what? I got eight books on Amazon. That makes money and running and operating the restaurant is not as easy as it looks. And it's not as lucrative as people think it is. You know, I've ran restaurants and I see that overhead really hurts people. My overhead is the commercial kitchen space that I utilize. And then I come to you and cook. So if I'm paying that once a month and I get to utilize that commercial space, instead of paying 31,000 for a space down in Southwest, I could pay $800 at one commercial space and not to really drop numbers on spaces and how much they charge, but I could pay $800 and that's like an apartment rent and everything else is my profit. So like I said, it's really not really necessarily about money. The money's gonna come. It's about your happiness. And in your career path, if it doesn't make you happy, find something else to do. <laughs>So I will share that you wanna have originality. Being creative and having originality is at an all time low. And you know, a lot of individuals like to see what other people are doing and copy what they're doing. And that's a problem. To me, it's always bothered me when I see individuals who will say, oh, well, Chef Anthony's doing this, I'm gonna do this too, because I genuinely put a lot of hard work into the craft. So. If I'm utilizing dry ice on my food displays, and then you say, hey, where can I get dry ice from? I want to start doing displays. To me, that's like basically saying I want to take money out of your pocket and I want to mimic your style. And like Drake said, you know, imitation is not flattering, it's annoying. And to me, it's very annoying. So finding that, I always say, find a creative, original uh, method to execute your business. So if that is, having a unique menu, or if that's having, you know, like my signature thing is wearing pink gloves. Now I have pink gloves, lime green gloves, purple, blue, black, and all of that. Sometimes I wear one and one, you know, these are unique trademarks. This is what will make you stand out. Of course, you gotta have good food as a chef overall, but I try to have unique things. So at one point in time, I was taking pictures outside on the balcony with the green trees in the background. Another time I started holding the plate so you can see my tattoos and you can see it. Another thing I was doing a couple years back, I was doing a sauce pour out of gravy boats. So, and then another thing that I still do to this day is a presentation. So I'll lay all the food out on the counter and I say, come on, gather around. Let me let you all know what you got. Let's start right here with this chopped salad. Now we got this butter poached lobster mashed potatoes. Hey, we got chicken skewers right here. And let's go ahead and add a little of my cougar sauce on top. Hey, we got this big tomahawk right here. And let me add an au pois, which is a French peppercorn sauce. And that was the demonstration I was doing. But those presentations are what help in or will help me take my business to the next level. Because now people aren't just buying into this awesome food. They're buying into the experience of seeing the chef present and talk about the food and pouring sauces and like I told you earlier, having a great personality and being a decent human being. Like, it's two words, personal chef. So personal also involves having personality and that's a good personality. And being a chef is being able to be creative in the kitchen and provide awesome dishes that, you know, not only you love and everyone loves. And presentation is definitely key. I eat with my eyes. A lot of other people eat with their eyes. I want people to look at the food and say, I gotta take a picture of this. I gotta make a video of this before I eat it. If they don't, I feel like I failed them. So using nice garnishes and, you know, making it look really, really pretty on the plate is a must. So if you're not going to perfect those things, then being a chef may not be for you, but if you're going to study and figure out what's going to look great so that my customers will keep coming back, then, Hey, I leave you with those nuggets right there. <laughs>So you ask, why do people hire us? I'll tell you why. One thing I do is I handcraft the individuals who I hire. So when I say handcraft, there's a specific look I go for. When I say look, I'm talking about very clean, well-kept, but on top of that, the biggest thing 
probably the biggest thing is having a big personality. So big personalities will gravitate people towards me and will gravitate people towards them. So my servers are like, I say, like Chick-fil-A individuals. You know, they just love the customer service. You know, uh, they're always looking to assist or help or, you know, just try to find a way to, you know, just bring a quality experience and my chefs are well-trained, whereas though I'm showing them if this is how I do it, this is how I season it, this is how I plate it up, you replicate the same way, you'll win. And they follow instructions. You can't have someone on the team that thinks that they're smarter than you or thinks that they're a better chef than you or that they're, they can actually outcook you in a sense, you know, because those individuals won't listen. They'll actually say, oh, you put sea salt in this Cajun, herb spice, guess what? I'm gonna put Old Bay and pink Himalayan sea salt. And guess what? That throws off the flavor palette of what you just produced. And you know, to me, you can't have those type of individuals. You gotta have people who listen, um, follow instructions and execute it the way you want it. You know, um, but people also hire me because they know I provide 100% quality ingredients, 100% authentic recipes. So I say I'm probably about a 90% scratch kitchen, whereas though my ingredients are 90% scratch, you know, and you can taste that, you know, you can taste when something tastes filtered, or you can taste when it, it feels like this, this, this was breaded beforehand. You know, this came out of a box already pre-breaded and just, you just deep fried this and put a glaze on it. Me, I'm in the kitchen, I'm seasoning up the fish and then I'm breading the fish and then I'll deep fry it and I'll pull it out and I'll drain it. And that tastes way different. So people know that they're getting the highest quality ingredients, 100% organic vegetables. You know, I show myself shopping at Whole Foods, Yes Market, Moms, uh, at times Wegmans, Harris Teeter, you know, so they know that they're getting the highest of the highest quality products. Um, and, and that means a lot to some people. And some people it doesn't mean much to, you know. So to me, I'm here to serve to everyone. And, you know, I just love putting smiles on people's faces, you know. When, when, when you're cooking and people walking in the house, their guests are walking in the house and they say, some smell good in here. It, you don't know what that does. Or when people taking bites and they're telling you, this, this kale salad is awesome. Even this is good, you know, and that's items that they didn't think. This is my first time having a Brussels sprout. This is my first time having vegan dirty rice. You know, I love being the guy to pop that cherry. <laughs>
But the only challenge you have is you're listening. And listen very carefully, because this might be you, so listen very carefully. They're not converting fast enough, which means they're talking, they like you, there's conversation going on, but they're not converting. So there's two challenges, right? Number one, I need to attract my ideal client to me who can pay me. And number two, once they get in here, I need to have a system, a sales model or a process so they convert faster. That means they pay you and then they come back. And if you're listening right now, you're saying, Shay, I wanna be able to do that, but I don't want my labor involved. I don't wanna work any harder. Shay, I'm, I'm at a place right now where I'm ready to reach more people. Um, I'm on a mission, Shay. And I want you to listen very carefully. You were called to serve a group of folks out there and you can't serve them right now because you don't have the revenue to purchase the resources that are necessary to execute that big vision. If that's you as you're listening, if any of that resonates with you, I'm gonna give you a website, which is Easy Sales Hub. Again, easysaleshub.com. Let me just spell it. I know you can see it below, but it's E-A-S-Y, sales, S-A-L-E-S, hub.com. Now, the reason you wanna go over to Easy saleshub.com is that that's the place you can come to and you can do two things. One, we'll do a sales audit. So we'll take a look at your sales process, your sales funnels, and we'll see how those are converting. Number two, you can have the tools and resources you need to be able to generate more revenue with less effort so you can serve more folks. So with that being said, as you're watching, go over to www.easysaleshub.com. My name is Shay Brown. Make it a great day, everyone, and um, we'll make some good things happen. We connect again next time. God bless.